Church has always been a vital part of every believer's life. Hello, I'm Pastor Gray, pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church here in Longview, Texas. Thank you for taking the time to tune in for this service. I'm standing in our auditorium, and here in just a moment, I'm going to take you into this auditorium as we are conducting the services here at 2200 West Loop 281. My heart's desire is that as the Word of God is preached, that God would do something during this service. Again, thank you for being with us. Enjoy the services. I'll be back at the end. God bless you. Take your Bibles. Go to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. I feel like on the Mount of Transfiguration when it was said it's good for us to be here. It's good for us to be here. And uh, Philippians chapter 4. I know we have family in town from the graduates that graduated uh, yesterday. So to the Brusky family, to the Tanuyan family, the Green family, and uh, Israel, what do you think? You have become the new standard for everybody who comes across the platform. Amen? Uh, so, uh, but praise the Lord for that. Philippians chapter 4, and uh, please do not let the familiarity of the text make us stumble across the truth for this morning. But Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse number 10. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 10, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we begin to dive into the text for this morning, Lord, I believe this is the subject, this is the text for us. And Lord, it was made even clearer in my spirit when I was listening to Miss Kelly sing. I was listening to to Brother Mark and Miss Jamie sing, the congregational, the choir, just the looked up and even to the point where I was watching the time on the clock during handshaking and Lord, it's just as evident that this is the text for the day. Lord, I ask that you would help us all as we look into your word and bring us back to where we need to be in our Christian life. And Lord, bless us on this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I love church, y'all. I, mm, I love the word, I love singing, I love church. Philippians 4.10, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Can we read verse number 11? Are you ready? Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how, both how to be abased. I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Verse 13, ready? Begin. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done, that ye did communicate with my affliction. Verse 15, ready? Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Here you have Paul as the focus of the New Testament. When God chose Paul there in Acts chapter 13 to separate me, Paul and Saul and Barnabas for the work of the ministry, there in Acts chapter 13, up until that point, Peter was the focal point, and uh, we get to Acts chapter 13, and, and God takes this dynamic duo, and now they dot the pages there of God's Word, and now all of a sudden they meet a sorcerer, and from that point, Paul, Saul becomes Paul, and Saul steps in front of Barnabas in the New Testament, and now this focus becomes about God's chosen servant to the Gentiles. And all of a sudden, Paul goes on a journey. Paul begins living for the Lord from the road of Damascus to now the laying on the hands. He has experienced no problems. He has experienced nothing but the touch of God. He has experienced the power of God. He now has gained the respect of the early church. He now becomes this driving force. His first splash into ministry was looking a sorcerer dead in the eye and calling him a child of the devil, full of all subtlety. Darkness strikes, the deputy gets saved, 
this is amazing. But from that point, as Paul starts walking through life, he had already been to school because he now is a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He had been to school. He had already learned everything. He knows everything about the Jewish tradition and the law. You are not going to tell Paul anything that he didn't already know. But there was one more school that Paul had to go to. And that was the school of contentment. God had to take Paul through contentment so that he could enjoy wherever he was at. I'm going to make a very bold statement. Whenever you find a believer that's not enjoying where they're at, they still are in school. They still are going through the school of contentment. There are times I think I've graduated from this school. <laughs> there, there are times I think I have arrived and I've earned my doctorate from the school of contentment, but only to find out I didn't know that that would make me discontented. When you look here in the text, it's very interesting that Paul's influence upon the church at Philippi, the churches he did directly start, and then there's churches and areas that he influenced. Philippi was one of those. In the church at Philippi, there was a love between the two. There was a mutual love. Go back to chapter 2 and verse 24. And, and, and I'm going to kind of give you some information at the very beginning. And then I'm going to give you the truth at the very end. And then we're going to head to the house. Philippians chapter 2 verse 24. But I trust in the Lord that I also sh myself shall come shortly. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my, need, to my wants. Here you have Paul. He's there in prison, and what happened was is the church of Philippi so loved Paul that they sent Epaphroditus. Well, while Epaphroditus was there, look at verse number 26. For he longed after you all and was, in full, and was full of heaviness because that he heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Here at this church at Philippi, that they were communicating to Paul, they were loving on Paul, they would meet Paul's needs. In fact, we're going to find out in verse chapter 4 and verse 15, if you'll go there, you're going to find out that all of a sudden, Paul recognizes that this care had flourished again. They had now come to the point to where they were trying to communicate with Paul. Look at verse 15. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. There's only one church at the very beginning that loved on Paul. This was the relationship that Paul had with the church of Philippi. Now, now here's where we're coming down to. When you arrive in verse number 11... He's writing this letter back to the church at Philippi, and he knows how much he's loved. So he is not going to take advantage of that love, but he wants them to know something. This is very important when it comes to people in their contentment. When people are content in their world, they do not use relationships to gain. And it was very important to Paul. Paul's not about to say what he's about to say for the sake of wanting them to feel bad. He was about to say what he's about to say to let them know, I'm okay. And that, whatever you have collected for me, please do not think I am standing here with this expectation it has to get here. I'm not standing here with this manipulation you better get it here, or our relationship hinges on if I get this care. No, 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 no. Paul was so content that he needed to let them know. And here's why he said this. Not that I speak in respect of want. They knew he was in prison. They knew that they sent Epaphroditus. They knew that when Epaphroditus came back because he had gotten sick, that Epaphroditus would give report. Paul's in prison. Paul's not doing well. We sent that first load to Paul. We communicated with Paul this whole entire time. And he's writing this letter so that 
Epaphroditus was not his spokesman because sometimes out of love, people around us will take our situation and they'll try to make it something of despair. When this was not the case in Paul's heart. Paul wrote this letter back because he was very important to him that the people that he loved and that he knew loved him so much that they sent Epaphroditus. And so much that they had sent care packages and they followed Paul. Paul, where are you going to be this week? I'm going to be in Thessalonica. Hey, we're going to make sure you get something. Paul, where are you leaving from? I'm leaving from Macedonia. Okay, we're going to, we're going to make sure you're taken care of. This church so loved Paul that Paul said, I better speak on my behalf before Epaphroditus paints a picture that's not true. True in my situation, not true in my condition. Your situation right now may be in want. There may be things in your life that you don't have that you need. You may be sitting here going, but pastor, you don't understand. I'm, I'm discontented right now. I am anxious right now. Things have got to get better. Things have got to go better. And I see it on the horizon and I see what I used to have. And you may be like Paul and say, I used to be a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I used to have it all. I used to be the one putting people in prison. And now I'm the one sitting in prison. Paul was amazing because Paul said, look, look, I love you. You love me. And I'm not writing this because I need anything. I'm writing this to let you know I graduated. Because look what he says here in, in, in verse number 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have what, please, learned. You know what Paul said? I had to go to school, and I had to learn some things. But the biggest thing I learned was this. No matter what my circumstance, I can still be content. There are people who are not enjoying church right now because they're discontented. There are husbands not enjoying marriages right now because they're discontented. There are children that are not enjoying family because there's teenagers that are discontented and something's wrong. Paul said this, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned whatever state I am therewith to be content. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul had to learn contentment. Life had to teach Paul contentment. It's not all going to be roses, but you can be content. It's going to be some thorns, but you can be content. You're not going to have that much money in the bank account, but you can be content. You can have all the money in the bank account, and you can be content. Your contentment and my contentment is not based on how much we have or how much we don't have. It should not be based on the mountain we're on or the valley we're in. Look what he said here, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. I am more, in labors, more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once, you think you're having a bad day, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robber, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by my mother-in-law, but in per- no, I'm sorry, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the, c- in the city, in perils, I love my wife's mother-in-law, all right, in perils in the city. I told Miss Kelly a joke, and she was just a ha, ha, ha. We told the same joke Friday. And she's rolling. She just now caught that joke. So if you hear Miss Kelly laugh here in a a little bit. In perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, verse 27, in weariness and painfulness and watchings often, in hunger and thirst and fastings oft, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is offended? And I burn not. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. Go back to Philippians chapter 4. You see, this was the school Paul had to go through because Paul 
had to learn contentment. He said, not that I speak in respect of want. I think it's time to set people free around us that are watching us go through a tough time. I think it's time to reach up and set people free around us that are watching us go through tough times. They see the shipwreck. They see the peril. They see what you're going through. They don't know how to interact with you. They don't know how to approach you. They don't, they don't know if they're going to say the wrong thing. Don't raise your hand, but you, you understand what I'm saying? They, they don't know if, if they bring up that subject, will it cause you to go to a puddle of tears? You may be in the middle of everything that Paul was going through, and you may be in the middle of school. But can I tell you, let's head toward graduation. Let's not repeat the fifth grade again. Let's not repeat the sixth grade again. And for all of us who repeated a grade, we have an alumni all of ourselves. <laughs> but let's not do this. Listen, as life is going on, you're going to face this. But Paul is the poster child for having gone through a lot of states, having gone through a lot of conditions, and now the people he loves the deepest, the people that were there with him, it was very important to him that he quickly write a letter back to them and say, listen, I'm not writing this because I'm in prison. I'm not writing this because I have need. I'm not writing this for any other reason than to let you know, I am content. Content? In prison? Content. Content? Not being able to go anywhere? Content. Content with a small cell? Content. Content, although you don't have? Content. If he was abased, he was content. If he abounded, he was content. If he was full, he was content. If he was hungry, he was content. If he was abounding, he was content. If he was suffering need, he was content. And in verse number 14, if you're there in Philippians chapter 4, he said this notwithstanding, ye have well done. He's trying to tell them again. He said, listen to me, you did good. And I'm going to tell you something. You met my needs when I needed. Listen to this. When I was trying to be content in Macedonia, you met my needs. When I was trying to be content in Thessalonica, you met my needs. I don't have time to develop it, but if you want a good study this afternoon, go back and look at what Paul went through when he was coming out of Macedonia, and go back and look at what Paul went through when he was in Thessalonica, and this church at Philippi said, let us know where you're going to be next, and we want to be a blessing to you, and there was this love, but his fear, and I cannot say this enough, his fear fear was that their love would make them think they did something wrong and they weren't what Paul needed and Paul was very quick to point out listen to me you are a blessing in my life and please don't think that my current condition is a result of your lack of getting me what I need in, in fact if you'll look at verse number 10 and we'll put it in context, look at it. But, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. And wherein ye were also careful. In other words, this care, they, they took it with great painstaking desire. Look at that last phrase. But ye lacked opportunity. Do you know that it's about, a, about an 800 mile trek to get to Paul? You know what Paul was saying? I know you've been collecting things. That's your style. But as I sit here right now and I look at what is coming my way, I want you to know I'm okay until it gets here. Most people are looking at the 800 miles in their future and going, how come that's not here right now? How come I can't, how, how come I can't have that right now? And we look at everybody else's life, and we look at, at the stage of everybody else, and sometimes if we're not careful, we'll say, well, 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 what's wrong with me? We're all going to school. We're all learning that wherever we're at, be content. Because your contentment is not based, should not be based on what you have or you don't have. Because look at what he said in verse number 13. We know it. Here it is. 
I can do all things through that care package when it arrives. <laughs> that is not what he said. You know what he said? Hey, I'm okay. Listen to me. I'm okay because my strength doesn't come from the Twinkie in the care package. My strength doesn't come from the beef jerky. Have y'all ever been on vacation and had more days left over than you had money? How many know what I'm talking about? Remember the old days, y'all, when you had a gas card? Now, you young people are not going to remember this. Remember the old days when they finally gave you an Exxon card? And on that Exxon card, you could get gas in anything from the inside of the store? So when you ran out of money, you took that Exxon card. You didn't need gasoline. You just put one gallon of gas in because you needed all that all that junk food in there because you didn't have any money. Let me tell you something. You know what Paul was saying? Paul was saying, I may not have, and that's not the reason I'm writing this church, but I just want to let you know, don't beat yourself up because I'm not sitting here going, you better get that to me. When people are discontented, there's an expectation that you better give me. The only reason I'm not saying amen right now is because I've been there. And the only reason you're not saying amen right now is because you've been there. This, this contentment. When you put contentment in the context of what is going on, can I make a statement? When contentment becomes your condition, then Christ will become your strength. When contentment becomes your condition, then Christ will become your strength. I'm going to ask you a question. If this is how life stayed, right now, if this is how life stayed, would you be okay? Or would you be ticked? If, if right now, Brother Larry, good to see you. If right now, and it's Miss Whitney, right? Yeah. If right now, life stayed like it is right now, how content are you? Now, I'm not saying that because I think you're terrible. I'm preaching this to all of us. Because here's how this works. If you will ask me that question next week, I'll probably in a better state. And pastor, if you would have preached this last week, I could have answered yes. But you have no idea what has gone on. Just be content. I'm not saying roll over and die. I'm saying be content. I'm not saying quit work. I'm saying just be content. You've done all you can do. You've worked as hard as you can work. You've said everything you can say. Just say, God, you are going to become my strength and my reason for living. Let me give you a couple of things and I'm done. Contentment is being okay with where you're at in life. That's contentment. Contentment is being okay with you here and what you need is 800 miles away. Contentment is being okay. It's like, it's like putting up a wall around you and you're just living in the moment. The hardest thing people do is live in the moment, especially people who use their brains and they have to manage and they have to think, they have to get this done. Let me, let me tell you, the best job to have around this church is on a mower. Whew. To get on a mower... And to put those head thing on and just drive. And you're cutting things down and you're running over things and they're spitting out everywhere. And then you look and go, ha, 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 stay out of my way. Because when you have to start managing this and managing this and managing this and you gentlemen that have to manage in your job and you're about logistics, you got to get this done, you got to get this done. How many times have you come home and we have been so not there? And your wife says to you, look at me, live in the moment, stop that. It's hard to turn your brain off. But I will tell you this, contentment says this, I am going to be okay where I'm at. Be okay. The second thing I would like to tell you, and look at verse number 14 if you will, notwithstanding ye have well done. Contentment is letting other people no, you're okay with where you're at. I've already said it, but I want to state it emphatically. When somebody comes up, there's a difference. There is a difference between somebody trying to be nosy in your life and somebody trying to express concern in your life. 
And if you're not okay, then tell him, I'm not okay right now. Could you pray for me? But learn contentment. And sometimes people don't know, and this is why you're going to have to go to the Lord. And only you and I know our motivation in our heart. If all of a sudden we're using a tragedy now as a tin cup to collect, those are hard words to hear. But only you and I know if we're using the situation we're in as a pity party to where we want people to pity us. Let me tell you something. God's got your back. God's got you. God will take care of you. He is your strength, not what people have collected for you. He is your supplier, not what people give to you. He is the one that's going to take care of you. Listen to me. You're going through a tough time. Look at Christ and say, Christ, this is where you have me at right now. And I didn't know Miss Kelly was kind of singing the solo until sometime last couple hours. Or yesterday, I should say, she told me. I didn't know what she was singing until I sat down there and I opened up her words and I should have took them. (laughs) And, uh, but can I tell you, if he doesn't deliver us, if this is it, if this is it, are you okay? If this is it, you got joy? You say, but pastor, I hurt all over. Let me tell you. This contentment, the third thing I want to tell you is this, contentment is being thankful, is being thankful to people who have helped you in the past with no expectation they'll help you now. Being content is that ability to say thank you to people who helped you in your past with no expectation that they'll help you now. Paul, it didn't matter to Paul. Paul said this, But I have all and abound, and I am full. Having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet sweet smell and a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Contentment is being thankful and thanking people who helped you. But at the end of the day, contentment is not being dependent upon others to meet your needs, but on God to give you strength. Did you hear that? Being content at the end of the day is not relying upon, depending upon others to meet your needs, but relying upon God to give you strength. Which is better? A temporary need or God giving you strength to make it through? Because your needs can be met, but only one can give you strength. Somebody can give you sustenance and food, and God bless you, but only one can reach down and give you strength on the inside. We've been going through the book of Acts. And we've been talking about apostolic powers on, 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 on Wednesday night. And I find it very amazing. They don't exist anymore. But I find it very amazing in the book of Acts, the signs and wonders that were done is when they could touch somebody and their ankles received strength and they got up and walked. And everybody stood back and went, Wow! God's alive. God's real. They needed those during that time. But you know where the signs and wonders come from right now? Is when a believer goes through a tough time and they still smile. The biggest sign and wonder is when somebody knows you ain't got nothing and you're still smiling. A couple years after I became pastor, and I have to be very careful and I have permission with the story, I was, I was, we lived on two lane over here, and, and I was coming to church, and in coming to church, there was a family from our church walking, and, 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 I'm, and I'm cutting up Fairmont, and, and I crossed Gilmer Road, and, and I kind of hit that dip and came up, and right there by the, the, uh, the uh, there's a daycare right there, there's um, apartments on the other side, and there's a family just, just walking from the church. So I, I pull over, and, and I said, hey y'all want a ride? And the dad looked at me and said, no, we're fine. We're just enjoying the day. And I said, where are you going? Pastor, we're going to church. Can I ask a question? Where's your car? And he said, oh, it didn't start this morning. He said, so I looked at the kids and said, guess what? God must want us to walk to church today. Come on. And here this family was, enjoying the day and just walking 
to church. I got to confess something. I would not be that happy. I am not walking to church. I'd be calling somebody going, you owe me. Get over here and pick me up. (laughs) Come on. You were thinking the same thing. Oh, well, you know, the car broke down. It must be the providence of God that I don't need to go to church today. God's working in our midst. (laughs) God ain't working in your midst. Your car just won't start. There's something about the contentment that says this. What? I'm content. I'm content if the car doesn't start. I'm content to walk. <laughs> Very humorous. We laugh about it now, but, but his wife wasn't with him. <laughs> I said, hey, man, where's your wife? She's home. <laughs> and uh, so, so <laughs> she had a headache. Uh, so, so no, <laughs> no, this. every time I see him, he, he's laughing right now. And so, so this, this content, <laughs> she's not. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this contentment of, walk, of walking to, ch- walking to church but, but there's something that is all about the oblivion, being oblivious to what you don't have and being content with what you have. Remember the, the old saying, you didn't know how poor you were until somebody told you? Life was content until social media happened. Oh, come on now. We were good. Until we found out, you got what for lunch? Like, who gets fried chicken for lunch? I got a bologna sandwich. But I got one bigger than that. Are you ready? Not only being content and being oblivious, but being content when you know what you need is sitting right down there. By saying this. Me having that or not having that has no bearing on who I am right now. Because who I am right now is I am a child of God. And there are things that would meet my needs, yes. They would make me a much better person, I think, yes. But that's not where I get my strength from. I receive my strength from the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of us, including myself, We're still in school because we haven't learned it yet. Some days we think we passed it. The other days we get the test back and it's an F. And we're like, ah, I'll try it again. But make Christ your strength. If you're here today and life has just turned you upside down and you can't find that strength, then it just may be you need a Savior. It just may be that you have no well to go to. Say, Pastor, I've tried everything. I, I've tried 12 steps. I've tried turning over a new leaf. I have tried everything. Then the only thing left to do is Christ. And sometimes life will take away all your resources to where you have nothing. You may have everything material wise, but on the inside, you just have nothing. You're empty and you're void. That void can be filled by Jesus Christ. And as you heard Brother Josiah say today, even at four years of age, someone can trust Christ. So where you're at, where are you? And dear believer, if you're not content, if life stayed this way right now, is your strength coming from what you have or don't have, or is Christ your strength? Thank you for taking the time to view our services. I trust that the sermon, the message, the truth was a blessing to you. My number's at the bottom of the screen. If I can do anything for you or Emmanuel Baptist could be a blessing to you or yours, please reach out to me, let me know. I also would like to know what God has done in your heart. I would love to rejoice with you. I would love to pray with you. I would love to add your prayer request to our Wednesday night prayer bulletin. So if you want to, number's at the bottom of the screen. Text me, let me know. God bless you, and I trust that the Lord will bless your day. Join us again for another broadcast here at Emmanuel Baptist Church.